Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's read the message text that's printed on page 9, Matthew 2, 1 through 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born, King of the Jews? We saw the star of our east and have come to worship him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the birth of your son. We thank you for the sacrifice, the sacrificial life that he lived for us. We thank you, Lord, for the death that he died for us and shouldered our sins on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit was sent and is now residing in us and is our teacher, our comforter, our guide. And Lord, all of that because you saw fit in the fullness of time that Jesus would be born of a woman. So Lord, we, we pray that you would guide our thoughts and our minds today as we look at this text. In Jesus' name, amen. After that wonderful kid's message, I thought, oh, I have a problem. I don't have enough lifesavers for you all. I don't have the bag. But I see joy in your face right now. So I'm thankful for that. Well, Happy Epiphany! Happy Epiphany! Today marks the beginning of the Epiphany season. Epiphany commemorates the Magi, the wise men, the three kings that we sang about this morning, as they come to worship the baby Jesus. These Magi are the first Gentiles, non-Jews, to worship the newborn king. The season of Epiphany is one of the oldest seasons in the Christian church year. Only the season of Easter is older. Up until the 1800s, Epiphany Day was more important than Christmas Day. What a thought. This season runs January the 6th through March the 3rd this year. Sometimes it's shorter, depending on the date of Easter. Well, in many countries of the world, yesterday was like our Christmas Eve. And today is like our Christmas Day. Celebrations are filled with parades and decorative floats and people in costumes dressed up like the Magi, bearing gifts. Christmas gifts are traditionally given on Epiphany in Spain and in most Latin American countries. In fact, children write letters to the Magi requesting presents, <coughs> not Santa. And children often leave their shoes out overnight, and they find presents in them in the morning. That's what's happening in many parts of the world today. It's a little bit different than we're used to. But the word epiphany means manifestation, and the entire season emphasizes Jesus' <coughs> coming, both as God and man. But today, Epiphany Sunday, we focus on Jesus being manifested revealed to the Magi, to the Gentiles. Well, we find the story of the Magi coming to visit Jesus and worshiping him only in the Gospel of Matthew. And in it, we see various people in the story who have different responses to the baby Jesus and the news of his birth. And we can see, I think, these same responses today among ourselves and in the world around us. See if you can identify with one of them. First, there are those who worship Jesus. Let me read again Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born, King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Well, the Magi... The Magi were from Persia to the east of Jerusalem, which is modern-day Iran. It's about a thousand miles away from Jerusalem at its closest. These Magi were astrologers. They were teachers. They were instructors to Persian kings and were looked to for their wisdom and their insight. When the Jews were taken captive 
Persia is one of the places that they lived. The book of Esther is focused there. <coughs> Daniel lived there. <coughs> Cyrus the Great, the king of Persia, was the king who let the Jews depart from their captivity to go back to Jerusalem. That's where the Magi are from. Historians tell us that during the ten years leading up to Jesus' birth, there was a strange feeling of expectation, a waiting for the coming of the king. They wrote that the air was full of a feeling that someone from the region of Judea would rule the world. People were looking. They were waiting for God. The desire for God was in the hearts of people, these historians write. This was the world into which Jesus was born, and the world in which the Magi lived. Well, the Magi, they saw a star. And from their knowledge of Jewish scriptures, and their study of astrology, they knew a king had been born. They associated that star that they saw with the birth of the king of the Jews. So they set off. They set off to Jerusalem. We don't know how long it took for them to get there. It could have been, could have been a two-month journey. The Bible doesn't really say. But we do know there were no paved highways, and there were no planes. Just plain old camels. Did you know that in a caravan of camels, that they can travel about 25 miles in a day? That means... For those of you who are calculating it in your head, they could travel a thousand miles in about 40 days. So from the edge of Persia to Jerusalem, it's possible that 40 days is what it took. Give or take. We don't know. The Bible does not say that there were three magi. There were probably a lot of people traveling together, including a part of the Persian army, for protection. We know that three gifts were given, and so a lot of Assumptions were that there's three magi. Well, the magi were very important in the culture of Persia, so we can imagine they were protected by the Persian army, or at least an entourage. For they carried, what, fine gifts of gold, and of frankincense, and myrrh, across a vast landscape. So worship is the first response we see directed toward Jesus. These Gentiles, these magi, these wise men came to worship the king of the Jews. Well, the story of these wise men, the magi, is wonderful. In their way, in their story, the Lord is saying, See, my son, he's not a savior for the select few. He doesn't discriminate. He doesn't differentiate. He doesn't separate or segregate. My son has come for underpaid shepherds who were stuck on the night shift as well as wise men who go first class to see the Savior. My son is the Savior for them and everybody in between. Jesus is a Savior for sinners. A Savior whose sacrifice spans the centuries. When you read the stories the histories of his life. You'll never find anyone who falls outside of the circle of his care and compassion, who is beyond the reach of his cross and crucifixion. He loves those who rejected him. He reaches out to those who are on the fringes of society. He forgives those who call for his crucifixion, who scoffed and scorned his suffering. You read the Gospels, and you like hundreds of millions of people through history, will be filled with gratitude for his glorious, glorious resurrection. Indeed, the Savior's empty tomb, his empty tomb says that all who believe on him will be forgiven, will find hope when trouble makes them tremble, will find peace when problems press down, comfort when death sneaks in to steal our friends, and to snatch away those closest in our hearts. The Magi came to worship him. Second, there are those who are troubled by Jesus. And we see that in verses 3 through 6 of Matthew 2. Let me read this. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, 
and all Jerusalem with him. When he'd gathered, when he'd called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. The Magi were asking all around Jerusalem where the king of the Jews was born. The king Herod heard of it. They didn't go straight to him. But all Jerusalem was troubled too. They were disturbed. It makes sense that King Herod was disturbed. He was very protective of his throne. The very suspicious of anyone or anything that threatened it. His father had been poisoned to death while on the throne. So Herod knew what could become of him if he let his guard down. There are many stories about his ruthlessness. And the people of Jerusalem, they knew each one. To protect his throne, he had killed his favorite wife. He'd killed a high priest. He had killed some of his sons and an assortment of other people. He was an earthly king with an earthly focus on earthly power. He would not understand Jesus, whose kingdom was not of this world. You see, Herod was so effective in controlling the region that Rome gave him a special title. King of the Jews. And here are the Magi asking for the newborn king of the Jews. Herod was troubled. Herod was troubled. It was not his son. He kicked his devious nature into high gear and he laid plans to kill the one he felt was a threat to his throne. So I think feeling troubled is another response we see to Jesus. When you feel that all you have and all that you control can be threatened by following him, it troubles you. You don't want to pick up your cross and follow him. You don't want to stop your way of living for him. Though he lovingly calls to you to place all your burdens on him, you're more comfortable trying to control your life. And if you just can't deal with this, you may react with hostility to stop him from invading your life. That was Herod's ultimate solution. Feeling troubled is a reaction people have to Jesus. Well, indifference to Jesus is the third response that we see. It says that all Jerusalem was troubled with Herod. Why would all of Jerusalem be troubled? We can see why Herod was troubled. Why would all of Jerusalem be troubled? Why should the priests, why should the Bible scholars be troubled? They knew the prophecies about the Messiah. Did they worry about job security? Did they worry about the control that they could lose? Why was the average Joe and Jane on the street troubled? Were they afraid that Herod might act with brutal and bloodthirsty retribution? If so, if they thought that, history shows they were justified. I think Jerusalem knew a bloodbath could be upon them with these innocent magi asking around for the newborn king of the Jews. They knew how ruthless Herod could be. We don't know what they did, but apparently they did nothing. They did not rush to see Jesus, to see if he could be the Messiah. They didn't make a beeline for him. See, indifference to Jesus. People just don't care to spend time looking into Jesus. His claims, the Bible, nothing. His birth is celebrated every year at Christmas. His death and resurrection every year at Good Friday and Easter. But it doesn't matter. You may be saying right now, well, I'm not troubled about Christ. I don't hate him like Herod did. But in reality, I just don't give him a moment's thought throughout my day. Well, years ago... A man, a survivor of the Nazi death camps, said this. The opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. 
May I suggest the opposite of loving the Savior is not hating Him overtly. It's just being indifferent to Him. Indifference is a lack of interest, concern. Jesus? God? Hmm, I'm, I'm too busy. That's the answer from a lot of people who are indifferent. Well, the story continues in, in verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. From later verses, we know that's not true at all. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to the country by another route. They are sent away by Herod to Bethlehem. That's where the Messiah was born. That's where it looks like he's going to be. And they arrived at the exact location using God's GPS star. It stopped right over the house where Mary and Joseph and the baby were. And what did they do? They bowed down and they worshipped him. Then they presented their gifts. Gifts for a king. To Mary. To Jesus. But Mary and Joseph... And Mary and Joseph were probably poor. We know this from the Gospel of Luke when Joseph and Mary, they took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord and for her purification. A purification ritual required a lamb and a dove, unless a lamb was not affordable, in which case two doves were acceptable. And they could only afford two doves. Because they were poor, the gifts given them by the Magi would very likely have helped them afford the trip to Egypt. An unexpected trip which they were about to take. You see, in this passage, we see finally the Magi being able to worship the King of the Jews, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. This was their goal. It's what the Lord had called them to do through the star and through scriptures that pointed them to Bethlehem. So in this short story, these 12 verses, reveals three different kinds of response to Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior. Those who are troubled or respond with hostility, like Herod. Those who respond with indifference, like the people of Jerusalem. And those who respond with adoring worship, like the Magi. So today... The Holy Spirit invites you to join the Magi and worship the King. Your King who gave His life for your life. Who grants forgiveness for all who need forgiving. Dare I say that would be all of us. Who promises heaven to all whom He would pull back from hell. Today the Spirit invites you to see your Savior. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of God and the peace of the Lord rule in your hearts. Amen.